Yes. Uh, so good evening, everyone. My name is Bridget Cooley. Um, I'm the coordinator of community planning at the Potter Memorial Library. I'm also a reference librarian there. Um, I have a huge uh, interest in local history, and I also serve as the volunteer archivist for the Lowell Historical Society. So um, I like to dig into a lot of history, um, and I like to try to help people find answers or connect them with um, possible, possible venues for answers. So um, we're going to cover a lot of different things tonight. This will not be everything in the city, um, but it'll be a good starting place. Um, and as different things, um, as different collections are being processed or as uh, items are being made available, it will constantly be changing. So um, things keep changing in the city for the better uh, so that we have more resources that are available for uh, for people to use and access. So. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, this is just a quick overview of things. If you haven't already started um, digging in your family history, or if you haven't kind of like figured out a system, uh, try to get as much of your information of your nuclear family that you know, um, get as many details as possible um, and kind of document them. If you have a family Bible, Make sure you're going to be the one who gets it um, because you will find all sorts of interesting things in there. Um, my great grandfather was illegitimate. And in my grandmother's version of the family Bible, uh, his father's name was listed, which was not what happened on his birth certificate from Sweden. Um, so those things uh, can be really unique and helpful um, when you're trying to track things down. Um, if you have access to any type of ephemera, diplomas, photographs, yearbooks, try to get everything that you can. Um, you never know what, what will help you there. Um, and then if you if you remember stories, um, they may not always be true, um, <laughs> but if you remember stories, kind of document down things because it'll help uh, determine where you might go to look um, or things that kind of get confirmed. Uh, thankfully, both my grandmothers were still alive when I started uh, doing research, um, and they could confirm a couple things for me, um, for family members, uh, you know, before they came to the United States. So it's definitely very helpful to kind of have an idea of what's going on and how it's processing. Um, the other thing is make sure you're very specific with what questions you want answered, uh, because uh, this can get very muddied and, and overwhelming very quickly. So start with small things um, and kind of work your way up. So you might wanna know who's in your extended family, exactly where your ancestors came from, uh, you know, how you arrived in the States, in New England, Lowell, that kind of stuff. Or, you know, sometimes you just wanna know family names and stories. Um, as part of reference, we tend to have to answer a lot of questions, usually from family members who don't know things. So like, I never met my uncle Bob. Why did I never meet my uncle Bob? Usually I have to say, are you sure you really wanna know why you didn't meet uncle Bob? I usually get confirmation. And then I send a lot of stories, um, usually from the paper about different things, but um, it is very important to kind of focus uh, just a project or part of, of your research and then work on that. And then if you get stuck, kind of try something different, but it's definitely, it's fun to answer these questions no matter what. Um, you know, Ancestry, a lot of other places have a lot of uh, resources already. Um, so there's a combination of primary resources that you can include, um, and we'll talk about these more in detail. Um, but I end up looking at a lot of secondary sources as well. So um, the library has a lot. Um, there's actually a lot on Google Books of uh, family histories and genealogies, um, especially if you're from a more affluential family and a different line, um, they'll, you know, they'll go back to England or they'll go back to Germany and they'll list lots and lots of details for you that you don't have to recreate. Um, the city, um, as, as kind of a nature of it, and a lot of people who like to write particular cultural inventories or histories of Lowell, um, and a lot of them include uh, photos, biographies, and things like that of some of the founders or some of the uh, politicians, the movers and shakers, the inventors, 
Um, so a lot of that stuff can be found um, online and in the library and the Center for Lowell History as well. Uh, the Center for Lowell History is in the Mogan Center. Um, it houses the U.S. Lowell's archives. It also houses uh, Lowell Historical Archives, as well as some of the Boston and Maine and a couple other groups. Um, so I recommend that if you have a project that you know of, you can set up an appointment, let them know what you're looking for, and they'll pull a lot. Um, many of the, di uh, the digital resources um, that are available online, uh, some of them paid, some of them not, uh, do have a lot of unique Massachusetts primary documents available. Uh, Ancestry, uh, which you don't have to pay for Ancestry if you don't want to, both uh, the Pollard and the Center for Little History have it available for anybody coming in off the street who wants to use it. Um, if you have a Pollard Memorial Library card, you can actually access it with your Pollard Library card from home. Um, and for library users, uh, you can actually download a lot of stuff. So even if you have an Ancestry account, but you wanna try, it's, it's at a lower level and you wanna try more, you can do that and use it. Um, and they have all sorts of different interesting things on there. Uh, Family Search, which is run by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So um, the Mormons are very into family history and kind of longevity. They have a lot of very specific um, items on there. They have certain immigration records. They have certain Massachusetts court records, probate records, common pleas. All of that can be found on there. Um, you do have to set up an account. So just be aware of that. You don't have to build a family tree, but you do have to set up an account for that. Um, but if I can't find something in Ancestry, I go there next. And then the last place that I use um, on a regular basis is American Ancestors. Um, it is uh, run by the um, New England His uh, Historical Genealogical Society. It has a lot of New England documents. Um, they partner with a lot of uh, different groups in this area. Uh, there's broadsides uh, that list all the students in Lowell High in the early 1800s. Um, they host the Archdiocese of Boston Digital Archives on there. So if you're looking for people who might have attended St. Pat's, um, did any of the sacraments at St. Pat's, um, it, it's gonna be on this site. Um, so I highly recommend it. You can get um, some guest logins, but you can't get full everything, but uh, you can come to the, uh, to the Pollard and use it for free. So it, it's a great site. And I'll show you a couple of things I've gotten from that um, down the road. So what can be found in the city? Um, there's a lot of stuff that can be found in the city, um, but there's people who like to do this. So don't feel like you have to do anything alone. You can definitely talk to any of the reference librarians um let them know any of your challenges talk to the center for Lowell history staff and tell them what you hope to find um you can also email the historical society especially if you're looking for some uh like quick genealogical questions if you need more involved genealogical services they're also available uh, through the historical society for a fee um and then i have a listing of a bunch of researchers who kind of specialize in Lowell history topics so Eileen Lucraft is on the uh, Historical Society. She does a lot with World War I uh, history. Uh, Richard Howe, who has a blog, talks a lot about veterans politics and general city history. Uh, Walter Hickey is my go-to guy for anything in the 1800s. Uh, Bill Walsh does a lot of the 1900s. Um, Martha Mayo, Gray, Fitzsimons, Lou Karabatsis, and Dave McKean also do a ton um, of research. They'll put stuff on social media. They'll share it on various Lowell um, history and kind of like Lowell memory sites. Um, and they'll actually share things through different uh, you know, blogs and, and things like that. And you'll get a list of blogs um, at the end. And I will email this entire presentation to everybody uh, here tonight. Okay, so uh, vital records. So birth, birth and death. Um, we have a lot at the Pollard and the Center for Lowell History. Most of that stuff is early to mid 1800s. Um, the city clerk, you can actually get vital records. I, you do need to have dates. Like you have to know birth dates and marriage dates and death dates um, when you submit them to the city clerk. Uh, you have to pay for them. Um, they're great to have. They give you a lot of information, um, but a good number 
of vital records can be found online as well. Um, as well as the Secretary of State has an index of vital records. Um, so you can follow this link. It actually gives you um, access to a lot of things, but if you're not exactly sure when your relative was born or you're not exactly sure when they got married, um, you can actually search by name and by city. So it's kind of nice. Um, cemetery records, especially if you're not sure when somebody died, um, you can contact the individual cemeteries. Um, a lot of their web pages do have some information. Uh, St. Pat's has a really great genealogy page um, where they logged um, through the late 1800s, all the people who were buried in St. Pat's, what plot they're in, that kind of stuff. So you know exactly where they're buried. Uh, Walter Hickey did Lowell MA genealogy. There's a listing of things on there as well, um, as well as the record of undertakers. Um, the index is on lowellmagenealogy.com and the Pollard actually has some uh, undertakers records as well. And then we can get a lot of the uh, obituaries off of microfilm. Um, so we have uh, digitized Lowell Sun from the 1878 uh, to 1977. And then we have um, it also on microfilm, even up to as early as three months ago. So you can actually get anything off of microfilm that you need. Um, and we also have a number of papers, which I'll talk about later, um, both at the Pollard and at the Center for Lowell History of various Lowell newspapers. So if your family was there early um, and they were, in, they might have uh, posted their obituary in Vox Populi or the Courier, we can actually help you get those as well. So these are uh, just a couple examples of um, what death registrations might look like. Um, these these actually were both obtained through Ancestry, um, but the city has uh, these big logs that kind of log everything, who you know, and it does list the person and whether they were single, married, their age, what they died of, where they lived, um, languages spoken, parents, all sorts of things. Um, it also, depending on the year, will give where they're, they're buried. Um, th this is actually the same year. <laughs> so there's like these log books and then there's also individual death records. Um, if you can get the individual death records, one, they're a lot easier to read. Um, and they're also usually a lot cleaner, um, but you can kind of find out different things. So I highly recommend them. Um, if you're interested in your family's uh, medical history, then you definitely want these because it gives a lot of details. This this was just a cerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage, but sometimes there's a lot more like pulmonary embolism and then kidney disease. And so if you ever want to know anything, I highly recommend it. Um, this is a, one of our, uh, this is a Rogers funeral record. So it's an undertaker record that we have at the Pollard. Um, it gives information related to the actual burial. Um, and some of them are a little bit more robust than others. Um, very similar to the, to the death records, but it'll tell you place of death, um, where they lived, name of the parents, where they're from, who the physician was, where they're buried. And then if you really care, you can find out how much was spent on a coffin the box, if there was a carriage hack that took a, the coffin, uh, opening the grave, all sorts of things. Some of these are really, really involved. Um, they'll talk all sorts of, you know, like certain masses and things like that. This is a pretty simple one, but there's a lot of the different ones that are available. Um, it keeps it interesting. Um, Besides the normal, you know, birth and death vital records, uh, marriages, baptisms, and more are available. Um, very similar uh, where you can find them, um, but I highly recommend um, that you you check American ancestors, especially if you have Catholic relatives from the city. Um, the Archdiocese of Boston records are really cool. Um, the only problem you have to remember is they are in Latin, so. It's not going to be David. It's going to be David um, and things like that. Or it's not going to be Mary. It's going to be Maria. But uh, once you get used to it, <laughs> um, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, but this will include things like uh, godparents and, and other things. So if you're looking for other people to search, um, the baptismal records are really good. Um, or the witness, the witnesses listed for marriages um, are very helpful. Um, 
and I enjoy them. Um, this is some of the examples of the digitized versions of the archdiocese records. Um, they do have text searchable um, formats, but this is actually a listing of bands from 1874. And then this is actually um, the baptisms from 1895. So you'll see that it is in Latin, um, but it does help um, kind of fill out different things in the city. Um, you can try requesting them as well from both the Archdiocese and the local churches, um, but this is a big project that the Archdiocese of Boston is undertaking. So if you have time, um, you can get a guest, I think it's a limited time, but I guess um, registration for American ancestors to try it out and check it out. Um, if you're looking for where your family members lived and work, uh, the censuses are great. Um, I do wanna remind, everybody, um, whether you know or not, that the 1890 census is really not available. So if you have relatives that came around that time, it gets a little bit more complicated um, to confirm that they're in the city, but it is doable. Um, both uh, institutions have physical copies. We don't have a 100% set. Also, the city did not do um, a city directory every year. Um, so we do have a listing uh, of, at both places of what is available and what's not available. Uh, a few of them are uh, digitized um, on Ancestry, and then a few are also on archive.org. Um, so that's available. Um, I do recommend maps and atlases um, to help you kind of figure out where they are in the city. Uh, the Center for Lowell History has a really great uh, digitized map collection. Um, as well as the Leventhal map um, as part of Boston Public Library has some, and then Digital Commonwealth also has maps. So if you're trying to find things that don't seem to make sense or they don't have a modern equivalent, um, definitely check out the maps because things like, and this is not a true street, but they'll be like Smith Alley was actually an alley that no longer exists. Um, so like Comiskey Way is actually an alley now. Um, there are a lot of streets that got paved under parking lots or got changed up with modern um, renovations. Uh, Coburn Street, which is the street that um, is right next to the library. If you're you know, coming off of Moody and you're heading towards Merrimack, it's Coburn Street. Well, it used to be way bigger, but um, the construction of the fire department and JFK Plaza in the 60s paved over it. So. Um, it, maps help to kind of clarify, you know, where things are. Also, uh, the city, most of down, mostly downtown, but some parts of the city were renumbered. So numbers that existed in the 1880s are different than numbers um, in the 1920s. So you may think you're looking at a house that that's where your grandmother lived, but it actually is a different house because the numbering got changed. So the atlases will help you do the comparison. The other thing is if you come from poor folks and there's nothing wrong with that, um, but there are different files uh, that you can look at. Uh, the Tewksbury Almshouse um, has uh, files at lowellmagenealogy.com and the Center for Lowell History. And then we also had this, the overseers of the poor files at Pollard, um, especially if they are newly arrived and they just don't have a lot of support. You can kind of see that. So this gives you an idea of what um, might be in um, a city directory. So you can kind of see uh, the names, what they did for work. Um, if it says B period, it means they were boarding um, on Appleton Street. Um, some of them say H, that means their house was on Washington Street. The earlier they are, the less likely you'll have um, street addresses. So usually it'll say things like, um, high street corner of this and that. Um, they weren't really super specific. Uh, as we get into more modern times, um, you can not only get their exact address and then get their telephone number, there's actually street listings so you can know who their neighbors were. Um, so if you wanna find out if your aunt lived close to your, your mother, you can kind of look at it and find out that they lived on the same street, things like that. So it's very helpful. And then this is an Overseers of the Poor record. Um, 
because the city was paying um, to kind of take care of them, uh, it, it gives you a lot of different information. This is an abbreviated one. Um, and a lot of times they'll add information, uh, but it'll tell you like if they're children, um, you'll see things like James admitted to Lowell Hospital, uh, the corporation paid for it. Um, Mary died. A lot of times there's acronyms. I believe that this is Chelmsford Street Hospital, um, but lots of different information. Some of these are really involved. Some of these even include um, years and payouts for the upkeep. Um, so if you have you know have a relative that maybe was there, we can always look it up for you and pull the record. Um, these are easy to scan, so you don't even have to come into the library if you don't want to. You can just request it. Uh, if you come from Im immigrants or refugees, um, a lot of the same stuff exists uh, for that. Um, but I would recommend that you try looking at passenger manifests. Um, if they came between 1855 and 1890, you can find a lot of the Castle Garden um, out of New York records um, on Family Search. Sometimes they'll pop up on Ancestry as well. Um, the Secretary of State has a specific Port of Boston records. So if they came directly to Boston, um, you can try searching for them uh, between 1848 and 1893. And then if they happen to come through Ellis Island, um, definitely go to the Ellis Island um, specific website because you can search things. Um, they have stuff where you can buy um, like large versions of everything, um, but you don't need to. Uh, the other thing is try searching for naturalization records on Ancestry and Family Search. Um, Lowell MA Genealogy has some of the naturalizations because they were done through the police court. Um, so they may be a good place to look there as well. Um, and then also work permits and school records. Um, a lot of times original documents are were needed to be obtained. Um, so at times we do have things like um, letters about when people came to the United States and who sponsored them. Sometimes we have original passports, um, that kind of stuff. So there's lots of different things there. Um, and then both the Pollard and Center for Lowell History have all sorts of cultural histories and studies. I had a guy come in and just said, I want to look at general uh, information on the Greeks in Lowell and ended up finding a picture of his grandfather in front of his grocery store um, in just a book. Uh, and his grandfather wasn't identified. So it wasn't like he showed up in an index or anything. It was just kind of flipping through. Um, so it is kind of interesting to see. So this is, this is my great grandmother. Um, she came from Sweden. In 1915, uh, thankfully she went through Ellis Island. So I kind of pulled her specifically because um, it makes sense. Um, but it gives you all sorts of information about you know gender, marital status. Uh, a lot of times they'll tell you like uh, sometimes they'll tell you who's sponsoring them. It'll tell you you know who is their family back home in case anything happens. You get passenger IDs. Um, for Ellis Island, it actually gave us a picture of the ship and which ship she came over from when she exactly arrived, um, when they left, things like that. So it's kind of a nice thing if you know your family came through Ellis Island. If you don't, and you're like my great grandfather who jumped ship in Galveston, Texas, um, we didn't know that that's where he jumped ship. We just knew that he came over first. Um, so we actually pulled his, his naturalization records um, and he settled in Sweden with my great grandmother after the, they got married three days after she arrived in the US in New York. Um, but you can kind of see different things. Um, I did like this one because I found out how much he weighed and like what his complexion was and that he had tattoos and my mother forgot. And I was like, hey, he had tattoos. And she's like, yeah, he did. Um, but you can kind of see like where he was on a merchant ship. So he came, the ship came out of uh, Belgium, but he was from Sweden. And so you can kind of get a lot of information from naturalization, um, which is kind of really, really nice. Um, so just so you know, he jumped ship in Texas in 1913 and it took him about a year to get to New York. And then he sent a telegram to my great grandmother and told her to came, come over. So they immediately married in 1915, but it took a little bit of time. So it's kind of a nice family story once you dig through a lot of that stuff. So 
one of the things I get to research a lot for people is uh, the black sheep of their family. Um, so there are stuff related to uh, files related to reform school. Uh, the police logs are really fantastic. Um, Lowell MA genealogy. Uh, Walter likes the police logs. So he did a lot of the uh, 1800s police logs. Like he actually went into the paper and logged it. Uh, but you can also find a lot of information in the newspaper. Um, much like social media is where a lot of people get their information today. Uh, 1800s, 19, early 1900s, everything played out in the paper. What, what judges said to people in court, all of that. Um, the other thing is you may want to look at uh, law library records. Um, anything common, please, is where most of it is, but you may want to look at probate, the police court, judicial court, and Supreme Court, depending on how uh, black your sheep was. Um, but this will give you some ideas of things that are in the paper from police court. These two, it's mostly drunks. Um, but if you can't find a lot of information, this might be the only place to find certain information. Um, somebody had me research George Reynolds. So George was uh, appealed his sentence of seven months at the State Farm for drunkenness. Um, a couple other ones people were asking me about. And you can see everything for like third offense. They were sent to the reform prison. They were fined a dollar, four dollars, six months in the House of Corrections. So if you're missing people, you can't find them. They may be in one of these places and usually it showed up in the paper, which is always kind of interesting. Um, if you have uh, soldiers, sailors, any type of military service, um, there's actually quite a bit of information uh, on uh, soldiers and sailors at the Pollard. Uh, we have grave registration cards, which were done as part of a um, works project administration uh, uh, initiative in the 1930s and 40s um, to log where a lot of our uh, veterans are buried. Um, a lot of times that includes what they died of, where they died, if they were missing in action, that kind of thing. It covers pretty much um, American Revolution era straight through a lot of the Native American wars, um, War of 1812, all the way up until some as late as World War II. Uh, if you have anybody that served in the Civil War, we have a lot of Civil War, uh, War service records. There's a gentleman here in, in the city who was obsessed with the Civil War and logged as many of the Civil War soldiers as he could uh, who were from Lowell or stayed in Lowell or settled in Lowell and where they're buried. Um, so he pulled a lot of their records. Um, we also have discharge books, um, which show, uh, you know, when they um, enlisted, when they left, if they came back. Uh, it also says if they um, went AWOL, disappeared, things like that. Um, so we can get that. We have a very few uh, War with Germany records, so World War I records um, on discharges. A majority of those are related to uh, people who worked at Fort Devens. Um, and we do have World War II discharge books as well. Uh, the other thing is if you know that you have um, kind of a more recent veteran, um, so 1900s, you can reach out to Veterans Affairs here in Lowell and ask for, for discharge records or information. Um, the World War II ones are really cool because uh, they're signed um, and there are also um, a thumbprint. So you get to kind of see different things. Um, and if there's anything in their discharges, it'll include um, any awards they won, any accolades, um, you know, any recognition. But there's also a lot of different resources um, around. Uh, we have the soldiers and sailors uh, booklets for the Revolutionary War and the Civil War that you can kind of look at. Um, they're, ind they're indexed. Um, and then also there was a special census done um, for the Grand Army of the Republic, which is what um, we called the Civil War soldiers once they came back. Uh, it was specifically done for soldiers and their widows to kind of document who was around and things like that. Uh, we also have um, soldiers' aides files and we're in the process of um, indexing them and making sure they're, they're available for people to use, but it would be people who came back uh, disabled or uh, people who didn't come back and their families needed support. It was uh, state and local aid that was given to those soldiers. Um, 
so we can find out where they're living or you know what they're appealing to uh, the city for in support um, so it's kind of a really interesting fun thing um, I also recommend that you try to find either World War One or World War II uh, draft registration cards. Uh, they don't necessarily have to have been um, serving, but they're required to register for the draft. Um, so you can kind of get information from these as well. Um, some of them are signed by uh, the person being listed. Some of them, you can see different things. So it'll tell you where they lived, especially if they're too old really to serve, they still had to register. It'll give you different things. Um, it'll give you some very unique uh, race listings, uh, depending on the year. Um, if they were a US citizen, if they were naturalized, if they were not a citizen, uh, where they were from, what their jobs were, who their nearest relatives were, their height, weight, anything. This one, he had a little finger crippled on the left hand. So anything that kind of makes them discernible. Um, they're really fun. I like to read these. I, I always try to see if any, especially any male has them um, when I'm researching the early uh, 20th century. Uh, house and home histories. Um, I know uh, Kathy says she has a lot from the acre. Um, a lot of uh, houses kind of disappeared at different times, but there's a, a lot of different information that you might be able to find. Um, we have physical copies of the cultural resource inventories and the neighborhood survey, surveys, both at the Pollard and at the Center for Lowell History. Um, the Center for Lowell History actually digitized them. Um, so you can actually see both the, the historical slash cultural resource and the neighborhoods um, at UMass Lowell online. You can kind of search it. Uh, the Massachusetts Cultural Resource Inventory has a website. Um, so you can actually search any boat anywhere in Massachusetts if it's listed as a historical site. So it doesn't have to just be Lowell. It could be Chelmsford. Um, it could be, you know, in Drake it if, you know, your family kind of moved back and forth across borders. Um, and Lowell also has a has a GIS um, system that's really good. So if you're not sure how old a particular house was or when you should start looking at atlases, um, this will give you a general idea of when it was built. It's not always perfect, but it's really good. Um, and then I also recommend that you reach out to uh, Richard Howe at the Middlesex North Registry of Deeds if you need to know anything about your house. Um, because a lot of the early records they have there, but they're not necessarily digitized or really easy to read, but they do kind of help you figure out stuff. So this is just gives you an idea of what um, this looks like. So this is a, a cultural resource inventory sheet. It'll give you, uh, we just have them for Lowell, but it'll give you the address um, if there's a, a historic name. So this one says Cabot Block. You'll see things that say block. Um, now, when we kind of talk about a block, it's a physical delineation. Um, historically, it's usually a group of homes or businesses that were owned by a particular person. So typically a person would build a set of houses. It might be referred to as the Cabot Block um, or the Hosford Block. And if you're not sure what that means, this kind of helps you figure it out. It's usually a block of buildings. Um, they'll give you all sorts of information about where it is. Uh, it gives you dates, what style it is, how what it was built. This one has asbestos in it, unfortunately. Um, and then if there's more, the following pages have a lot more information about the house. And sometimes it'll tell you like who lived there or who, um, deeded it to whom, things like that. Um, this along with the atlases can tell you who, who owned different pieces of property. Uh, so when I showed you uh, the death record um, for, uh, for Augusta uh, Gates, she actually owned the land that was her house because her father deeded it to her, um, did not deed it to the husband. Husband never owned it. It was actually just owned by her outright. Um, the entire time. So it, it tells you a little bit about logistics and things that are going on uh, in the city and how people are kind of doing their business. So other things, um, we have lots of Lowell City documents. So if you have any politicians or you have any craftsmen or anybody who uh, provided a service to the city, uh, usually the Lowell City documents will tell you if they got paid by the city or if they were contracted by the city. 
um, or if they were a politician, how they served. Um, yearbooks can be found, uh, very few at the Pollard, very few at the center. Um, online, there's some of them are digitized online. Um, one of my favorite things to use, especially if you have somebody who's been in the city for a long time that kind of held any sort of political or educational um, or business oriented um, work in the city are the contributions of the old residents uh, historical situation association or the contributions of the Lowell Historical Society. That gives you a lot of generic history. Um, there's uh, essays that were written about the history of the post office in the city and who served it. Um, they can be found at Google Books. You can, there are also copies at both the Pollard and the Center for Little History. Um, but I like to use Google Books because it tells me the names in the book um, and then I'll go pull the actual book um, for me. Uh, there's archival collections at all the sites. Uh, Center for Little History has um, what is known as the Lowell Files. It's images, archival materials and more related to uh, various little topics. So it could be anything from um, Massachusetts mills to banks, to churches, um, to artists, musicians. Um, and we actually have a, a small version of the Pollard as well. So if you're looking for, I know uh, Kathy mentioned French Canadian. If you happen to have a French Canadian who is in a musician, a musician uh, we do have like sheet music at the Pollard and things like that. So there's just a lot of stuff that's available um, at the city to kind of talk about. Uh, right now, uh, the center is actually processing the George of Lowell. So George of Lowell, the photographer, took millions of photos and his collection actually went to the center. So they're in the process of dealing with that. The Historical Society has the Lowell Sun collection from the latter part of the 20th century. So there's a lot of pictures of uh, young Paul Songus and fires in the city, things like that. Um, and then UMass Lowell is doing a fantastic job digitizing a lot of different information um, and making it available. Uh, a lot of it is owned by uh, UMass Lowell or it's owned by the Lowell Historical Society. So they're digitizing it to make it available. Um, they have a couple different places that they do that. Um, if you go to this libguides.uml archival digital collections, <coughs> that's, it houses everything. Actually, let me see if I have it up. So this is actually it. And you can kind of see there's this general one, but they have some very specific um, opportunities. So little city documents, uh, city engineers um, are pictures of the streets when the engineers were doing different work. Um, there's a Little Canada collection, LTC. Um, there's some different things on the Center for Irish Partnership, Anchor Dance Troupe. Uh, so a lot of this is part of the Southeast Asian Digital Archives. There's some different uh, cultural resources, uh, drawings for the proprietors of the locks and canals, and then and different things. So these are just really fantastic. Um, opportunities to see different things. So like this is the Tewksbury Alms House. You can actually search by name. I don't have a regular name, but this is a, this is actually a, a record, an intake record. So you can learn from that from there. So it's really just a fun um, opportunity to see different things. I highly recommend that. Um, places where I've gotten information that I wasn't expecting. Um, I was looking for somebody where they were living and actually found it on their marriage certificate. Um, but for whatever reason, they weren't caught in a census and they weren't caught in the city directory, but they I knew they were married in Lowell. Um, the other thing is, depending on your relatives, if you can't find them being married in Lowell, um, consider just doing a general Massachusetts search or a general New Hampshire search because if they were marrying outside their uh, cultural heritage, a lot of times they ran away. Um, or if they were Greek, they were going to a very particular church. So I've actually found people who said, oh, my family was definitely married in Lowell, but they were actually Greek and they wanted to be married at a particular Greek church in Boston. Um, so just make sure that you consider that. Uh, baptismal certificates, um, as I said earlier, definitely highlight uh, godparents, but a lot of times they might be people that, that were living in the same household. Um, 
death certificates, especially if they had their own house and they're on the older side and they move in with a son or a daughter, um, it'll tell you who they were living with at the time of death. Um, cemetery plot records, which you can request um, from uh, the local cemetery. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but it'll tell you things like unrecorded family members. Um, so when I was doing some research on my mom's family, you know, I found my great grandparents and I found my unmarried uh, great aunt and great uncle. And I knew that they were buried there. Um, but when I kind of checked other family plots, I found out that all of the children um, who were either stillborn or died very young were actually uh, were actually buried with my great great grandparents. Um, so you kind of find uh, family members you might not know about um, or who might have just come back um, to Lowell that you weren't planning to have here. Like you, they, you know, they're living in New York and you can't find them in New York, but they have, end up in, you know, in Lowell. Um, in newspapers, definitely consider, um, you know, using nicknames, shortened names, um, or anglicized names. Um, a lot of times, uh, different groups will, you know, change their name. The Greeks have done that where it's like they have a first name that's very English, but they kept their last name or they shortened their last name, but then they kind of revert back. Um, ever since social security cards were a little bit more strict on names. <laughs> um, but prior to that, um, it's very fluid. Um, and I have a number of Civil War soldiers who have two or three aliases besides their actual given name. So just be aware that that there might be some flexibility or you know using a middle name and that becomes the common name and you only find it um, when you know you're doing some research. Um, and then at times I don't discount a Google or just a browser search uh, to kind of find things you need um, and don't discount it. Um, I Googled one of my family members from Sweden and actually found a family tree in Swedish and Google allowed me to translate it to kind of get an idea of that I was on the right path, which was really nice because I wasn't so sure. Um, and my great great grandmother was, um, you know, had died really young. So I didn't have much information. And then my great grandmother died when I was two. So the ability to kind of confirm information I needed actually from somebody who could read uh, Swedish and kind of discern it for me. So it was very nice. So places that I use online on a regular basis um, are, you know, Google Books, uh, occasionally Google Scholar, Hathi Trust. They have a lot of, uh, you know, history of um, documents. So they'll have history of Middlesex County, history of Chelmsford, which um, for those of you who um, are newer to Lowell, uh, Lowell didn't exist before 1826, and we have um, accessioned a lot of land from Chelmsford or Drakeit. So if you have had family here a long time, you may actually want to look in those towns as well, um, because they may have actually been Chelmsford or Drakeit residents before their land became Lowell. Uh, Digital Public Library of, Lowell, of America has some great things. Digital Commonwealth um, is probably one of the places I go the most uh, to see um, Photographs um, or maps, they don't have a ton of documents. They're adding more and more each day, but it's a really great site. Uh, Internet Archive has a lot. They have some of the digitized city directories. They have stuff from Lowell Telemedia. Um, UMass Lowell is putting a lot of their stuff on there as well. Um, so it's a really great site um, to kind of get an idea if a place in Lowell has your stuff. And then Open Library also is good. Um, you know, these are different uh, library catalogs to use. Um, you can kind of search uh, the Pollard. You can look at all the MVLC libraries, uh, which are the, uh, there's 37 libraries in the consortium the Pollard is part of. Uh, UMass Lowell also has uh, their own website and their own catalog. So if you want to make sure that they have a particular book that you want to look at, um, or if you're doing research and you find a reference, you can check our catalogs and see if we have it available to you. Um, and both of both UMass Law and the Center for Law History have access to a lot of different databases. So it's really, really nice. Uh, these are all uh, 
websites that are specifically UMass Lowell related. So if you are a former, former UMass Lowell or Lowell Tech or um, State University of Lowell, all that kind of stuff, you can actually get a lot of different things on there. Um, they're doing a lot of specific um, groups. So there's the Southeast Asian Digital Archives. It's very specific to uh, Southeast Asians that came in the late 60s through 80s. Um, includes like how they were acclimated, how they uh, got resources, their support networks, things like that. Um, and then the Portuguese American Digital Archive is covering uh, the Portuguese community in both Lowell and Hudson, Mass. Um, and they're doing a great job with highlighting like music and clothing and um, businesses, the churches, that kind of stuff. So these are all um, regular genealogy uh, resources I use online. Um, usually just give me an idea and then I usually call cemeteries or I'll kind of dig into something else. Um, Heritage Quest is also available. It's um, kind of like uh, similar to Ancestry, um, which you can use at the Pollard um, as well. And then I use a lot of blogs, especially if I uh, run into kind of a dead end. Um, all of these lovely people um, write about Lowell history and things that are happening. Um, so like the Historical Society will do different um, focus on different um, monuments or uh, issues that are happening in the city. Um, the city does their own. Um, Joe Orfont does a lot on uh, history and architecture. Um, Eileen Lucrest covers the veterans. A lot of them are on World War I. Um, so it's just a really fun thing. Uh, Little Irish is specific to the little, um, the little Irish community in the little in the acre. Um, Lowell Cemetery has different things um, about who's buried there and you know what their role is. Um, the National Park does a great job, and and there's a lot of different ones. Um, if you have a house that has a little placard on it, or you see a building with a placard on it, and you want to know more about it. The historical marker database will show you what it says on the sign. Um, so occasionally if I'm driving around and I'm like, I saw that, uh, you know, you can search uh, historical houses and buildings and things like that as well. Um, the American Antiquarian Society is in Worcester. They have quite a bit of information as well. Um, that's, a, that's digitized and available online. Um, and then Newspapers online, there's a lot that can be used um, from the comfort of your own home or, uh, you know, you can use newspaper, uh, newspaper archive, which is the digitized version of the Lowell Sun um, at both the Pollard and Center for Lowell History. Um, from 2001 to present, you can actually search, you know, more recent editions of the Lowell Sun. They are only text. So if you're looking for a picture of a fire or something, we have to pull it from the microfilm, but you can search for it. Uh, various obituaries. Um, you can get the current Boston Globe and the New York Times online, as well as some other newspapers. If you don't already have a Boston Public Library e-card, um, you may want to get one. They have some really great um, 19th century newspapers, um, including the Lowell Daily Citizen and some other things. So I've used them. Um, to do research, you can also get the Boston Globe 1872 to 1990. So if I'm looking for kind of um, things that don't seem to be covered as fully in the Lowell Sun, I can actually use my Boston Public Library e-card to do these. And I find it's really helpful um, in helping me track down uh, dates and, and things like that that's going on. There's also a lot of newspapers in the city um, that are microfilmed. Uh, these papers are very acidic, so we try not to keep it around because all it does is yellow and kind of destroy everything around it. Um, but you'll see, like, these are a lot of different different um, versions. So we have, like, the American Citizen, Chums for Phoenix. We have some that are all in French. We have some that are just advertisers, the Courier Citizen, Sunday Telegram, a Greek newspaper, Vox Populi. These are great. These are all at the Pollard. Um, we don't always have every edition, but we have a lot of it digitized. Uh, the Center for Lowell History also has a lot. Um, it's actually like 20 pages listing everything that they have, um, but definitely feel free to email um, either place and, and 
check in with us about like what we might have available or if we can help you out. Um, be advised that the early, the 1800s newspapers, the font size is somewhere around font size four. Um, <laughs> so on microfilm, it's nice because you can blow it up to legible um, reading size. Um, but uh, the format that we're used to of, of a newspaper now is not how it was in the 1800s. They didn't really have a lot of um, headlines, not a lot of um, imagery. As you get a little bit older, they start to put in some imagery, images um, and drawings, but a lot of times it's a lot of hard reading and it's six pages in the newspaper, but it's all text. Uh, but there's some really great French newspapers uh, at the center as well. And then we have even more stuff on the microfilm. So um, this is both Historical Society and UMass Lowell, but there's uh, you know the Boston Main Railroad Bulletin, and there's some payroll records. Um, if you think that you've had relatives in the city for a long time, so, so in the first 25-ish years of the city, um, both of us have the city valuation records. It tells you everybody who paid a tax in the city between 1826 and 1850. Um, we have some listing of patients, toll books, passports, all different things. So lots and lots of fun stuff. Um, and then feel free to always ask uh, us about your challenges and difficulties. A lot of times we might think about your problem in a different way. We might think of a new uh, option for you to try. But these are the major institutions um, that I recommend um, for you to, to start with Lowell Records and we can always um, refer some more. So uh, the Pollard is open um, Monday through Thursday, nine to nine and Fridays and Saturdays, nine uh, to five. The Center for Lowell History is open uh, Monday through Thursday, nine to five. Uh, you do need to schedule an appointment to go in. They have a limited number of people that um, have access, but you can definitely do that. Um, and they usually do the third Saturday of the month. I don't think they're doing that for December, uh, but you can definitely make an appointment. Also, you can definitely email or call uh, either institution and we're happy to um, do some research for you. Also, we tend to work together really, really well. So if I don't have an answer, I will usually reach down there to say, do you have this? And then I, you know, I'll make the referral um, that you need to go there because they have what you're looking for and that. Um, does anybody have questions? Because I talked about a lot of stuff. So you can either you can either unmute or you can actually put it in the chat box, either one that works for you. So how far back does the Lowell Sun go, Bridget? Like is the American citizen before the Lowell Sun? Yeah, so Lowell Sun, Sun is at 1870s. Um, and then there's there's plenty more before that. So okay. that's pretty, yeah. oh, that's um, further back than I would have thought. So that's pretty yeah. good in 70s. Thankfully, um, <laughs> thankfully um, both the Sun and the Courier we have a good amount of um, what was offered there. So usually like if I can't find an obituary or an article mention in the sun, um, it's usually in the in the carrier, but like um, the American citizen is like 1850s. Um, there's actually some that go back as far as like the 1830s and 1820s. So like mm -hmm. if you, you know, they're not easy reads. Um, because they're so tiny, but there is a good amount of stuff that if you're willing to to kind of dig into the paper, you might be able to find it. Mm -hmm. No questions. What a lot of information you covered. So the resources are excellent. Thank you. Sure. So yeah, so um, I made sure I confirmed everybody was here. I mean, like I said, I am taping it, but what I'll do is I'll actually send you the PowerPoint. That way you can, you know, copy and paste or just click on the links and go right to um, yeah. the resource pages. So you don't, <laughs> I, ha I have this working document that like it's in Google Drive and I'm like, every time I use something new, I add it. So I don't forget <laughs> that I used it before. Um, a lot of it is, uh, 
it's things that I just I'm tenacious if I can be um, to try to find an answer for somebody. Um, so um, I get real creative on where I might find information at. Um, and I also reach out to a lot of fantastic uh, historians in the city that say like, where would you go next? Um, and they reach out to me. And it's funny that, you know, you think somebody who's been doing local history in the city for you know, 50 years knows everything. And occasionally I'll just be like, oh, you should look at that map. And he's like, oh my gosh, you're so right. I should have looked at that map. <laughs> but sometimes it's just nice to get the outside perspective um, to do that. And, you know, if there's if there's something you don't want to ask right now, that's fine. You can feel free to send me an email um, or to give me a call and just say like, hey, you know, I attended your thing and, uh, you know, this is where I'm stuck or you know, what would I recommend doing? Um, or, you know, I mean, I had somebody come in from San Francisco into the library and I was like, I don't have any of your records that you want here. Um, but I ended up finding um, some of the information she was looking for because she was trying to actually apply uh, for dual citizenship and she needed like her grandfather's military ID and we were able to find that and then I was like this is where I would go I would call the San Francisco Public Library and ask these questions and and so a lot of times it's you know when you're talking to somebody who does it for other people they might think of something a little bit different thank you sure any other questions uh, so, Bridget, are you available to uh, talk to directly about questions that we have? So, if you want, if you want, yeah, we can set up we can set up an appointment. Um, usually, I do a lot of programming, but uh, around the holidays, I don't do as much programming because a lot of people are busy. So, if you have a, a day and a time that's good for you, yeah, we can set up a time to kind of um, hash out things. And if you usually, if you can send me like what your general questions are, I will pull things and have it ready for you. Great, great, great. Thank you. Sure. And like I said, I wear multiple hats. So if I have a little bit of lead time, I will usually be able to like dig into like the historical society's catalog and stuff at the center and then stuff at the Pollard to kind of be prepared. Nice. Yeah, I love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions okay so like i said if if there's no other questions tonight feel free to uh send me um an email or if you want to leave me a voicemail it's best to, to send me an email because i do a lot i do do programming and things like that so i'm not always at my desk um but if you tell me what you're looking for, I can usually do the uh, the research offline and then kind of forward you information and see if we're on the right track um, or make recommendations. Like I won't do your entire family tree, but if you're kind of stuck, <laughs> um, I am happy to kind of, you know, dig through things and, and find different stuff um, for you or find news articles or mentions in the paper biographies. Um, nothing is really off limits to what I'm willing to do um, to kind of, I love to find the information. So um, it's always fun. And I mean, I've been known to go into like Harvard's catalogs and do searching um, if it relates to uh, different things. I've reached out to the Boston and Maine and been like, I need access to your employee records. Can you see if you have this person? Um, so I had people from Ireland come over um, and I was trying to get them stuff, you know, that day. They didn't give me a heads up. They just showed up. Um, and and we were able to find some stuff. We weren't able to find a lot of stuff, but we were able to find some stuff. So I always like to let people go with a little bit of fun things and information. Perfect. Anything else? No. Thank you so much, Bridget, for all that info, though. It's really great. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. So I will, I'll send this out um, probably uh, in the next like 10, 15 minutes, this PowerPoint. If you have any problems um, with it, just let me know and I can convert it. Actually, maybe I'll just convert it to a PDF for everybody. So you should be able to just um, use the clickable links okay. um, and take care of it. And then again, um, my contact, my specific contact information is on the back page. 
Um, and then the uh, organizational information is on the second to last page. So you have access to kind of different people. So if for whatever reason not available and you wanna to talk to somebody, um, this gives you both uh, institutions to kind of reach out to. Um, and there's, like I said, there's a lot of places in the city that have some really, really great um, archives. We're digitizing and making things available as quickly as we can um, on different uh, topics. Um, digitizing takes a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of manpower, um, but we're trying to make as much of it available um, for people when they need it. So we're very, very excited to have it um, available. We're actually helpful, you know, happy to help anybody as well. So I'm gonna Thank stop. you, Bridget. Absolutely, Thank have you. a great night, everybody. And Thanks, please you too. Do not hesitate to reach out to any of the uh, resources that I listed. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. Good night.